When we first meet Moldaver, she's invading Vault 33. She infiltrates the vault pretending to be the overseer of Vault 32, only to have her raiders go on a murder spree inside the vault so that she can get what she wants to kidnap the overseer of Vault 33, Hank McLean. Much later, we see Moldaver again, only this time she's no longer a raider boss. She's the leader of a bunch of NCR warriors defending their home against a violent raid by the Brotherhood of Steel. She's a scientist whose goal is to give free power to the people of the Wasteland, not hoard it for her own faction, but to give it away for free. How did Moldaver go from a murderer and a kidnapper to a wannabe savior of the Wasteland? To find out, we have to go back in time. Because Moldaver's story doesn't actually begin in Vault 33, it begins in 2077 at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Cooper Howard is invited to a meeting by an old actor friend of his named Charlie. He arrives thinking that it's going to be a pro-communist meeting, and he's been wary about communism running amok through Hollywood because this takes place in the middle of Fallout's Red Scare. When he arrives, he finds Moldaver leading the conversation. Only she doesn't go by the name Moldaver at this point. Her name is Ms. Williams. But just as he expected and feared, Ms. Williams was talking a lot of hogwash against America. When you think of the promise of the American dream, you think of California. But it is just a dream. It's not real. That's about all the horseshit I can take. And he couldn't handle it, so he stormed out. But before he could leave, Ms. Williams told him that she knew something about his wife. Because he loved his wife, because he came here due to the fact that he was concerned about his wife, he stayed behind after the talk. And it's then where we find out more about what Ms. Williams knows. How do you know my wife? My research company was acquired by her division. We were developing this kind of technology, cold fusion, infinite energy. That's what I was on the verge of achieving when vault Tech swept in and bought up every company I'd ever worked for. Here we find parallels between Williams and Moldaver. Both characters start off as bad guys, a raider, a communist only to be revealed later as industrious and working for the betterment of mankind. In fact, Williams denies being a communist. I'm not a communist, Mr. Howard. That's just a dirty word they use to describe people who aren't insane. She's not a communist. That's just what people call her. And they call her a communist simply because she's critical of America. The two good sides to this character, so far, are walking in sync. Williams, a pre-war scientist, has been developing cold fusion and is close to a breakthrough. Moldaver, a post-war apocalypse survivor, has somehow learned that her pre-war research project has been completed, and she seeks it to better the wasteland. But how can such a person with such noble goals be this person? invading a vault, killing innocent people who had nothing to do with vault Tech or anyone else who wronged her. How could the leader of the NCR, the New California Republic, have her soldiers massacre people in a vault? And here's the big elephant in the room. How could Moldaver still be alive? We understand how Cooper Howard's alive. He got turned into a ghoul. The radiation from the nuclear apocalypse of 2077 ghoulified him. And as we know, ghouls don't die from old age. That's why he's still alive 219 years after the end of the world. But Moldaver isn't a ghoul. Well, we don't know for sure, but there are a few possible explanations. Those who have played Fallout 4 know that cryogenic freezing existed as a technology in pre-war America. That was the entire point of Vault 111 from Fallout 4. Within the first 10 minutes of playing the game, we encounter this technology. Nate and Nora were frozen in cryopods where at least one of them stayed alive and healthy for 200 years. And we know that this technology wasn't ignored by the makers of the Fallout show. 
For while exploring Vault 4, Lucy discovers a bunch of pregnant women who had been experimented on, impregnated with monsters, and then cryogenically frozen. The survivors of Vault 4 kept them in these cryopods to help ease their suffering. But Moldaver was never a resident in Vault 4. If she had been, she would have become a victim to these experiments. Well, we also learn at the end of the series that Vault 31 was also filled with cryopods. Junior executives in Vault Tech's Buds Buds program were cryogenically frozen in Vault 31 to be released slowly over time to become overseers of Vault 32 and 33. And we know that Moldaver did have a connection to Vault Tech. As Ms. Williams, she told Cooper Howard that his wife Barb's department at Vault Tech scooped up all of the projects she was working on. She made a lot of money. So what are you, a millionaire communist? Hypocrisy is like violence in your movies. If you only let the bad guys use it, the bad guys win. Maybe she got a spot in a vault. But Norm, while exploring Vault 31, accesses a registry filled with the names of the people in these cryopods. And neither Moldaver nor Ms. Williams are on this list. We know, however, that this is an incomplete list. There are far more cryopods in Vault 31 than names on this list. There have been more overseers of Vaults 32 and 33 that don't appear on this list. So this list is incomplete, and perhaps her name is on another list. But we have to remember that this vault was for junior executives in Bud's Bud's program. And even though Moldaver had a tenuous connection to Vault Tech, she was never a Vault Tech executive. And at the point in her life where we meet her in 2077, I doubt very much that Vault Tech would have ever wanted her to become one. So it's unlikely that she was in this vault or in any other vault where they cryogenically froze people. So where does that leave us? During one of the end credits panouts of the show, we find a sign near the Topps Casino advertising cryopods. Could Moldaver somehow have gotten advanced warning that the bombs were dropping and managed to get one of these rooms that had a cryopod in it to preserve herself so that she could complete her research at some future point? The ultimate answer is that we don't know how she's still here for sure. But I think the show has given us enough clues to infer that she was likely cryogenically frozen. It's possible that Moldaver's existence could be part of why Hank McLean was traveling to New Vegas at the end of Season 1. If there were cryopods at the Topps Casino, perhaps Moldaver survived the apocalypse in one. And perhaps the people who helped Moldaver suspend herself for over 200 years have answers that both Hank McLean and Cooper Howard want. This is by no means the only explanation. Moldaver could be a clone of Williams, for example. Though clones are just genetic twins, they don't necessarily have the same wants, goals, or desires as the person that they're cloned from. But it's clear that Moldaver has the exact same goals, motivations, and desires as Ms. Williams. I think they're the same person, and I think being frozen cryogenically is the most likely explanation. If she was cryogenically frozen, I'm really interested to learn when she got out. Because Moldaver appears in one of Lucy's childhood memories. She's in Shady Sands when Rose brings her children there in 2277, or 2281, depending on what you believe. We get the impression from the way that Rose looks at Moldaver that Rose and Moldaver were in a romantic relationship. This is reinforced much later when we see the ghoul of Rose sitting at a dining table with Moldaver. Why would Moldaver keep Rose's ghoul alive? There was no real reason to do this. If anything, the ghoul of Rose is an affront to the memory of Rose. From everything we know about Rose, she was a kind, intelligent, and loving person. Not a raving monster that we see seated here. And that's why Lucy 
kills the ghoul of Rose. This was no longer her mother. This wasn't the woman who raised her. This was an affront to her memory. But apparently, not to Moldaver. I think the only reason that Moldaver would have kept the ghoul of Rose alive, so to speak, is because she was deeply in love with Rose. And losing Rose in the nuclear detonation of Shady Sands traumatized her to such an extent that she couldn't bear to be without her, even if it meant that she could only be with a husk of what Rose once was. At the very end, as Moldaver sits dying, she clasps hands with the corpse of the ghoul of Rose. She knows that the ghoul is dead. She knows that Rose is now completely dead, but she doesn't succumb to grief. She stares as the lights turn on across Hollywood at her final success after the hard work of a very long life and quietly dies. This trauma that altered her perception of reality enough to keep a ghoul alive for decades also radicalized her. And this radicalization can explain her behavior in Vault 33. With the destruction of Shady Sands came the destruction of one of the capitals of the NCR. It likely didn't completely destroy the NCR, but it certainly destroyed the local NCR government in and around Hollywood. Moldaver became the leader of the NCR in this region. We don't know if it was in an official capacity or an unofficial capacity, but she and her soldiers wave the NCR flag, wear military uniforms, and fight on behalf of the NCR. She's developed a reputation for herself of being cutthroat and dangerous. Name of Moldaver. Now that bitch is dangerous. Well... When it comes to leadership these days, dangerous is what they call a prerequisite. But despite this, survivors of Shady Sands worship her as if she was a prophet. These people want to see the NCR return, they want to see Shady Sands rebuilt, and Moldaver is their only hope. I'm gonna guess that she did have the full support of the NCR government elsewhere in California. Perhaps before the destruction of Shady Sands, Moldaver was content to live out her life with the love of her life in Shady Sands. But after the destruction of Shady Sands, after the destruction of Rose, she needed a cause to keep going. And that cause was the NCR. That cause was the people of the wasteland. And she could help them by reviving the research of her past finishing Cold Fusion. The person who took Shady Sands and Rose away from her was a vault Tech executive. vault Tech attacked the NCR. Moldaver is now a leader in the NCR, and as the ghoul just told us, in order to be a leader in this wasteland, being dangerous is a prerequisite. Therefore, vault Tech was the enemy. Moldaver had never been in a vault, at least not as far as we know. But she was in love with a former Vault Dweller. She knew that the regular people of Vault 33, the test subjects of Vault 33, weren't complicit in the crimes of Vault Tech. They didn't know what Hank McLean and his ilk were really doing. And despite knowing this, despite knowing that she would likely be killing innocent people, despite knowing that she could potentially be putting the children of Rose in danger, she infiltrated the vault. The barbarity exhibited by the raiders in this vault leads me to believe that these weren't NCR soldiers. At least, not all of them. There were a few occasions during the raid on Vault 33 where some of these raiders showed a little bit of discipline. Perhaps these were NCR soldiers. But I get the impression, based on the behavior of many of these raiders, that Moldaver made a deal with a local raider gang, offering them access to the riches and comfort of a vault if they helped her with her infiltration. Only that, I think, can explain why so many of these raiders just went on a rampage, a complete, disordered, chaotic rampage, killing on a whim, gorging themselves, getting high on drugs, 
there were two distinct groups of infiltrators that Moldaver brought with her. The disorganized, chaotic raiders, whom she trapped in the vault with the vault residents when she left, and the orderly, disciplined NCR soldiers, whom she took out with her. Moldaver never personally kills anyone in Vault 33. But she is responsible for the infiltration of the vault, and she's ultimately responsible for the behavior of the people she brought into that vault. I think the blood of all of these innocent Vault 33 residents is on her hands. This is why Hank McLean was right when he said, That woman over there, she's no different than me. As I explored in my profile video on Hank, due to the indoctrination he received from vault he saw Shady Sands as an enemy. He saw them as a threat to world peace. The only way to get rid of war is to make sure there are no factions, according to Hank McLean and vault -Tech. If the problem with the world is factions endlessly fighting, endlessly at war, then what is the solution but to get rid of the factions? Therefore, he had to destroy the faction NCR by destroying Shady Sands. He was doing it for the greater good. Moldaver needed to get cold fusion, and it didn't matter who got in her way. She knew there were people in Hank's vault who were innocent. There's no way she couldn't have known she was in love with a former Vault 33 resident who likely shared her entire life story with her. But she went in anyway. She allowed these innocents to get murdered for the greater good so that she could give cold fusion to the world. Now, on one hand, we're comparing apples and oranges. Moldaver is responsible for the deaths of, of about a dozen or so vault dwellers. Hank McLean is responsible for the deaths of an entire society, possibly even 30,000 people or more. That's a big, big difference. I am in no way saying that their crimes are equitable, but their motivations are. They both thought they were doing the right thing, and they were both willing to kill innocent people to achieve their goals. Hank was radicalized by his vault tech brainwashing. Moldaver was radicalized by her trauma. Maybe a dozen or so innocent people is an appropriate price to pay for free power to the wasteland. But then again, maybe 33,000 lives are a fair price to pay for the end of all wars. Moldaver was a good person, a good person who did some evil things for the best of reasons. The problem is that almost all evil things are done with the best intentions. At the end of season one, Moldaver's story is left unfinished, and yet she dies. And so I worry that her story won't be completed. And I hope that worry is ill-founded because there are some questions I want answered. Was she really cryogenically frozen? If so, where? If so, for how long? And if so, who froze her and who released her? Why was she released nearly 20 years ago? Was it for a specific reason? Did she have a mission? Or was she on a timer? Did she intend to ever complete Cold Fusion? Or was that a thread she only picked up after the destruction of Shady Sands? And with Moldaver gone, who will pick up where she left off? Who will lead the NCR? Perhaps the answers are waiting for us in New Vegas. Perhaps the answers lie within the Topps Casino. Maybe we'll find out more in Season 2. But what do you think of Moldaver? Do you think she's redeemable or irredeemable? Is murdering innocents excusable sometimes if the good you're doing it for is great enough? Or is murdering innocents never excusable, no matter how good your intentions are? Should Moldaver be held accountable for the deaths of the people of Vault 33 at the hands of her raiders? And do you think cryogenic freezing is the most likely explanation for her being out in the wasteland 219 years later? 
Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already and you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I have a plush for sale. My one-of-a-kind plush is in stock and ready to ship, but I've got limited quantities, and I'm almost sold out. If you want to make sure you get your hands on one before I am, snag one today. I've also got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in another way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members get little badges that appear next to their names in the comment sections of my videos and access to ox emojis that they can use in my video comments and in the live chats of my live streams. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more Fallout videos.